pleasure to have very you. Nice. Thank you. Very good to see you. It's all yours. Thank you. Well, Tony, let me start by saying thank you to you and your team. The CBI is a valued institution in this country and a powerful voice for business. And let me thank all of you, because I know things are tough right now. You rightly want to know what you can expect from me. You saw what mattered to me as Chancellor with policies like furlough, acting with empathy in the national interest. Above all, being bold, decisive, and radical. Now, let me tell you what I want to do as Prime Minister. I said on the steps of Downing Street that I would put stability and confidence at the heart of this government's agenda. And last week, we did that with a plan to grip inflation and balance the books. I said I would bring fairness and compassion to help the most vulnerable. And we've done that too, not just with record increases in pensions and welfare and help for people's energy bills, but by controlling inflation. Because the best way to help people is by stopping mortgages, rents, and food prices from spiraling out of control. Re-establishing stability is the critical first step. But there's so much more we need to do. I'm not just here to solve problems. I want to build a better country, where we get inflation down and grow the economy, where we cut NHS waiting times and improve the quality of care, and where we invest more in schools and give every child a world-class education. And critical to achieving all this is innovation. That's my theme today and a defining focus of this government. I sometimes worry that when people hear the word innovation, all they think of are the latest gadgets, a smarter watch, better TV, or faster car. But to me, innovation is much more about new ideas, new ways of doing things that drive economic and social progress, the product of creativity and ingenuity, and what Roosevelt called bold, persistent experimentation. I want to lead a country where that mindset and that culture of innovation permeates every aspect of what we do, where it's at the heart of our economic policy and at the heart of our vision for public services. The question is, how do we do that? First, we need to harness innovation to drive economic growth. Second, we need to embed innovation in our public services, especially our NHS. Third, we need to teach people the skills to become great innovators. First, growth. Now, Tony, you rightly challenge us to be ambitious for growth. Well, there's one factor above all that drives growth. Over the last 50 years, innovation was responsible for around half of the UK's productivity increases. But the rate of increase has slowed significantly since the financial crisis. This difference explains almost all our productivity gap with the United States. So how do we fire up the innovation engine? Well, we believe that the very act of creativity and exploration is itself a reward. So it starts with government investment in basic science and research. In a challenging time, when we are making difficult decisions on public spending, in last week's autumn statement, we protected the budget for research and development, 20 billion pounds, almost a fifth of our entire capital budget 
the highest level of R&D this country has ever seen. And we're investing in high-risk, high-reward research with the new Advanced Research and Invention Agency. But more important than what government does is what you do. It's private sector innovations that really drive growth. Now, you'd expect me to say that. I'm a conservative. But it's true. And that's why the autumn statement cut taxes to encourage larger companies to do more research and development. It's why we want to allow businesses to claim R&D tax relief on pure maths and cloud computing. And it's why we're absolutely committed to using our new Brexit freedoms to create the most pro-innovation regulatory environment in the world, in sectors like life sciences, financial services, AI, and data. But any credible strategy also needs to support fast-growing businesses, those firms disproportionately responsible for our future growth, turning million-pound businesses into billion-pound businesses, and turning billion-pound businesses into 10 billion pound companies will create good, well-paid jobs for the British people. But too often, those firms can't access the finance they need. That's why we're radically reforming the regulation of our insurance and pension sectors, as well as our listing rules, to release a flood of new funding for exciting, innovative businesses. And we'll need to go further but this isn't just about what large businesses and financial markets can do. We want to support small businesses to innovate too. On every high street, in every market town, every day, we rely on brilliant local businesses, from the greengrocer to the dry cleaner to the local plumber. We should be ambitious for their future too. The real prize is supporting them to innovate. And that's exactly what we're doing with new initiatives like Help to Grow and Made Smarter. So make no mistake, our most pressing task when it comes to growth is stability and controlling inflation. But that will never be the limit of our ambition. The more we innovate, the more we will grow. And we have a plan for both. Now, second, we also need to create a culture of innovation in our public services. Now, I grew up in an NHS family. It's in my blood. And as your Prime Minister, I will always protect an NHS free at the point of use. And that's why, in a budget where we had to make savings overall, we didn't cut the funding for health and social care. We increased it by £8 billion. So let no one ever doubt our commitment to the brilliant men and women who work in our NHS. But our ambition for our country's most important public service cannot be measured solely by the money we spend, but by the quality of care every patient receives. We all want it to be easier for people to see their family GP. We don't want our loved ones waiting so long for ambulances or for the operations they need. But better care requires innovation. Now, in part, that means new drugs and new technologies. And this country should be proud of how we are leading the way, not just with the extraordinary COVID vaccine, but with robots assisting surgery, doctors being trained with virtual reality headsets, and drones transporting prescription medicines to patients in remote locations. And medical technologies like these are only the most visible form of innovation. But we also need to radically innovate how we do things. That's how we'll really improve the quality and speed of care and make the money we invest in the NHS go further. To do that, we're opening community diagnostic centers to deliver millions more tests, checks, and scans close to home and without having to arrange multiple appointments. And our new elective surgical hubs will offer hundreds of thousands of patients quicker access to the most common procedure. That the very act of creativity and exploration is itself a reward. 
So it starts with government investment in basic science and research. In a challenging time, when we are making difficult decisions on public spending, in last week's autumn statement, we protected the budget for research and development, 20 billion pounds, almost a fifth of our entire capital budget, the highest level of R&D this country has ever seen. And we're investing in high-risk, high-reward research with the new Advanced Research and Invention Agency. But more important than what government does is what you do. It's private sector innovations that really drive growth. Now, you'd expect me to say that. I'm a conservative, but it's true. And that's why the autumn statement cut taxes to encourage larger companies to do more research and development. It's why we want to allow businesses to claim R&D tax relief on pure maths and cloud computing. And it's why we're absolutely committed to using our new Brexit freedoms to create the most pro-innovation regulatory environment in the world, in sectors like life sciences, financial services, AI, and data. But any credible strategy also needs to support fast-growing businesses, those firms disproportionately responsible for our future growth, turning million-pound businesses into billion-pound businesses, and turning billion-pound businesses into 10 billion pound companies will create good, well-paid jobs for the British people. But too often, those firms can't access the finance they need. That's why we're radically reforming the regulation of our insurance and pension sectors, as well as our listing rules, to release a flood of new funding for exciting, innovative businesses. And we'll need to go further but this isn't just about what large businesses and financial markets can do. We want to support small businesses to innovate too. On every high street, in every market town, every day, we rely on brilliant local businesses, from the greengrocer to the dry cleaner to the local plumber. We should be ambitious for their future too. The real prize is supporting them to innovate. And that's exactly what we're doing with new initiatives like Help to Grow and Made Smarter. So make no mistake, our most pressing task when it comes to growth is stability and controlling inflation. But that will never be the limit of our ambition. The more we innovate, the more we will grow. And we have a plan for both. Now, second, we also need to create a culture of innovation in our public services. Now, I grew up in an NHS family. It's in my blood. And as your Prime Minister, I will always protect an NHS free at the point of use. And that's why, in a budget where we had to make savings overall, we didn't cut the funding for health and social care. We increased it by eight billion pounds. So let no one ever doubt our commitment to the brilliant men and women who work in our NHS. But our ambition for our country's most important public service cannot be measured solely by the money we spend, but by the quality of care every patient receives. We all want it to be easier for people to see their family GP. We don't want our loved ones waiting so long for ambulances or for the operations they need. But better care requires innovation. Now, in part, that means new drugs and new technologies. And this country should be proud of how we are leading the way, not just with the extraordinary COVID vaccine, but with robots assisting surgery, doctors being trained with virtual reality headsets, and drones transporting prescription medicines to patients in remote locations. And medical technologies like these are only the most visible form of innovation. But we also need to radically innovate how we do things. That's how we'll really improve the quality and speed of care and make the money we invest in the NHS go further. 
To do that, we're opening community diagnostic centres to deliver millions more tests, checks and scans close to home and without having to arrange multiple appointments. And our new elective surgical hubs will offer hundreds of thousands of patients quicker access to the most common procedures. But we need to go further still. We want to give patients genuine choice about where and when to access care. And those choices need to be informed by radical transparency about the performance of our healthcare system. We're also making sure the NHS has the workforce it needs for the future, with the right number of doctors and nurses in the right places, as well as thinking creatively about what new roles and capabilities we need in the healthcare workforce of the future. When it comes to the NHS, we all share the same ambition to give everybody in the country the best possible care, free at the point of use. But to deliver it, we need to be bold and radical in challenging conventional wisdom, and that's what we will do. Now third, there can be no innovation unless people have the skills to innovate. That starts with our schools. So last week, we announced an extra £2 billion in each of the next two years. But funding is not enough. There is no responsibility as Prime Minister that I feel more deeply than how we develop a truly world-class education system, giving every child in our country the best chance of life and preparing them to enter a rapidly changing world. The Times were right to challenge us about what that looks like. And we are asking ourselves radical, searching questions about the curriculum, because young people need to enter the modern economy equipped with the right knowledge and skills, and about technology, because we want to help children engage and learn better and save teachers time. We also need to end once and for all this mistaken idea that learning is something you finish at 18. So we will also deliver our lifetime skills guarantee to help people of any age retrain and acquire new skills. I believe in the very core of my being that education is the closest thing we have to a silver bullet in public policy. It is the most transformative thing that we can do for our people something you as employers know all too well. And I am determined to get this right. But to make this country a true island of innovation, we also need to attract the best and the brightest from around the world. So we will unapologetically create one of the world's most attractive visa regimes for entrepreneurs and highly skilled people. And one of the areas we need to be most ambitious is AI, artificial intelligence. Because this isn't just a new technology. It's a general purpose technology, like the invention of the steam engine and the computer chip, with the potential to transform every aspect of our lives. So we cannot allow the world's top AI talent to be drawn to America or China. That's why building on the AI scholarships and master's conversion courses I instigated as chancellor, we are launching a new program to identify and attract the world's top 100 young talents on AI. Less build it and they will come, and more let them come and they will build it. But we must be honest with ourselves. Part of the reason we ended the free movement of labor was to rebuild public consent in our immigration system. If we're going to have a system that allows businesses to access the best and brightest from around the world, we need to do more to give the British people trust and confidence that the system works and is fair. That means tackling illegal migration. And that's what I am determined to do. So to conclude, innovation matters. It matters because it creates more jobs, higher wages, and better opportunities for people. It matters because it improves our schools and NHS. And over the long term, by boosting growth 
and creating more productive public services. Innovation is how we will cut taxes for people and businesses. That's why I'm placing innovation at the heart of my governing agenda. And despite the challenges we face, I'm optimistic about the future because the golden thread of our national story has always been innovation. The idea that what's yet to be discovered is surely even greater than all that's come before. I want the United Kingdom to be a place of learning, discovery, and imagination, of potential realized and ambition fulfilled. That's how we'll improve the lives of all our people. And as your Prime Minister, that's what I'm going to do. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're going to take some questions from the media. Should we start with the BBC. Thank you, Prime Minister. Simon Jack, BBC News. Um, we know that chronic labour shortages and weak post-Brexit trade are holding economic growth back. You heard this morning businesses are saying we need looser immigration rules and closer ties with our biggest market, the EU. Are you listening to them? Well, I think the country's number one priority right now when it comes to migration is tackling illegal migration. It's stopping people coming here illegally on small boats across the channel. Because when people see that happening, it undermines trust in the system. It doesn't seem fair that people are able to break the rules. And that's what I'm absolutely determined to fix. Now, I want to be honest, it's not a simple problem to solve. We can't solve it overnight, but I am determined to reduce the number of illegal migrants coming here. We started making progress on that. My conversations with President Macron enabled us to conclude a new deal with the French to help us better police the channel, put more people working together with the French in France. But there's more work that we need to do, and the country should be reassured that I will tackle this as one of my highest priorities. And if we're doing that, then I do believe that we can, that it's right to ensure that the United Kingdom is a beacon for the world's best and brightest from around the world. You heard me talk about that in the speech. I want to make sure that we can win the global race for talent. And I'm unapologetic about wanting to deliver an immigration system which is highly competitive for the best and the brightest. And that's what we'll deliver. But I think the most pressing priority right now is tackling illegal migration. And that's what I'm determined to fix. Next, ITV. Hi, Prime Minister. Um, Harry Horton from ITV News. Uh, we've heard the director of the CBI say that there is a shortage of workers at the moment and we need a new deal on immigration. Last Friday, your Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, he said he wants to see the vast majority of trade barriers with the EU removed. How are you going to change our relationship with the EU on legal immigration and on trade in order to boost growth as so many businesses at this conference say they want to see? Well, thank you. I think on, on migration, I'd, I'd point back to what I've just said, Harry, but on, on trade, let me be unequivocal about this. Uh, under my leadership, the United Kingdom will not pursue any relationship with Europe that relies on alignment with EU laws. Now, I voted for Brexit. I believe in Brexit. And I know that Brexit can deliver, and is already delivering, enormous benefits and opportunities for the country. Uh, migration being an immediate one, where we have proper control of our borders and are able to have a conversation with the country about the type of migration that we want and need. Right? We weren't able to do that inside the European Union, at least now we are in control of it. When it comes to trade, it means that we can open up our country to the world's fastest growing markets. I've just got back from the G20 in Indonesia. Uh, we're talking about signing CPTPP, where we've got some of the most exciting, fastest growing economies in the world, and we can become a part of that trading block. That's a fantastic opportunity for the UK. Or indeed regulation. And you've talked and Tony's talked about growth. You've, talked, you've heard me talk about innovation. Well, we need regulatory regimes that are fit for the future, that ensure that this country 
can be leaders in those industries that are going to create the jobs and the growth of the future. And having the regulatory freedom to do that is an important opportunity of Brexit. And that's my agenda, and I'm confident that that agenda is not only right for the country, but can deliver enormous benefit for people up and down the UK in the years to come. Uh, next, The Times. Thank you, Prime Minister. Alex Rauf from The Times. Uh, given the rise in corporation tax next year, will you commit to increasing uh, investment allowances, such as the super deduction scheme, which the likes of the CBI and other business leaders want? Well, Alex, I completely agree about the importance of unlocking private investment. It's one of the things that's held our country back over the past few decades. And if we want to be serious about driving up growth, then we need to unlock more private investment, not just in R&D that I talked about in my speech, but also in capital. It's something I've spoken about in the past. So that's why I was so pleased that the Chancellor, in spite of the difficult decisions that needed to be made, was able to make permanent the annual investment allowance. Uh, now, that at a very high level of a million pounds. Now, what does that mean? That's essentially full expensing for 99% of British businesses. There's nothing like that that I think exists in almost any other advanced economy. It makes it incredibly easy and tax efficient for companies to invest in new equipment, new machinery, new plant that can drive up our growth, drive up our productivity. Uh, and that's why it was right that the Chancellor did that. But it's also right that we continue to look at that and see that we do everything we can, whether it's through the tax system or otherwise, to support all of you to keep making investment in the future growth of our country. And next, Bloomberg. Thank you, Prime Minister. Lizzie Burden, Bloomberg. Over and over, we hear critical voices coming from the business community about the Conservative government's performance. Are you still prepared to say explicitly that the Conservatives are the party of business? Lizzie, thank you. Yes, un unequivocally. Unequivocally, and you, you heard it in my speech. Uh, it's important that government creates the conditions for stability. Uh, for making sure that we tackle inflation. But that's just the foundation. Now, all of us collectively need to build on that foundation. And what my role is, what the government's role is, is to ensure that we can unlock all of the things that we want you to do and what you will want to do, whether that's investing more in new machinery and equipment and automation, whether it's investing in R&D to create the products and services of the future, right? expanding into new markets. Ultimately, it's business that creates the wealth the jobs that this country needs. It's not government that does that. And I think you've seen from my track record as Chancellor that I stood by all of you. I stood by business because I knew how important it was to our country. I knew how important it was to safeguarding people's jobs and their livelihoods. And that's my track record as your Chancellor. And you can rest assured that as your Prime Minister, I will continue to build on that legacy and ensure that we make this country one of the most exciting, dynamic places for businesses small and large anywhere in the world. That's my ambition. That's what I want to deliver for you. And I think we made a very good start on that last week. But there's lots more that we can do. Thanks, Prime Minister. We are going to have a few business questions. Uh, I've stolen the first one. I'm really sorry. Uh, I was praising your May's lecture earlier this year. Uh, and in it, you talked about the UK not having a competitive tax regime compared to our competitors on innovation, skills, and capital allowances. Thanks for stealing that question, Alex. <laughs> uh, tell me, do you think we now have that competitive regime for incentivizing skills, innovation, and investment, or is there more to do? Well, those are exactly the right three areas to focus on, and thank you for your kind words about the Mays Lecture, Tony. Uh, but I talked about capital, people, and ideas, and I think many of you think about your businesses in a, in a similar way. And it's right that our tax regime, but also our regulatory regime, supports all of you in delivering in those three areas. So we're definitely making progress, as we just talked about the AIA, and full expensing for 98, 99% of UK businesses, million pounds, permanent. Nothing like that exists anywhere else, as far as we can tell. Enormous support for the vast majority of businesses in this country to invest more. I think that is not just competitive, it's probably the most competitive tax regime for investment you can find. You talked about R&D, the Chancellor increased the research and development expenditure credit, the tax relief for large company R&D, significantly in the autumn statement, because, as you know, innovation drives future growth and productivity. 
But it's not enough just to increase the rate. We want to make sure that our tax regime keeps up with the way that all of you actually conduct research. And what we'd heard from life sciences companies, that there's more investment in cloud computing and data to do drug discovery. That wasn't covered by our regime. So we now want to make sure that our regime does cover that. Again, it's something that the vast majority of other countries haven't done yet. So I think it gives you the confidence you need in all of you that we take this seriously and we'll keep delivering it. But there's always more to do, right? This, this budget, or this autumn statement, there was a first step. The precondition is stability and tackling inflation. But we didn't stop there even last week. We started to deliver on a longer term ambition to make sure that this is, as I said, the most attractive place for all of you to invest in capital and people and ideas anywhere in the world. And I'm highly confident that we can deliver that. And that's a powerful message for everybody. Now, we have three questions that have come in from members, and we wanted to pick the ones that were about innovation, your theme. So, Claire, where's Claire? Claire Barclay, who's the UK MD of Microsoft. Claire, Mike, coming to you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, you set out a, a vision to be um, a global science and technology superpower. Um, what would your message be um, to all the businesses in the room, um, and many of them are investing very heavily in digital and technology, as well as the role that um, the public sector plays in accelerating that, and what can we collectively do together? Well, thank you, Claire, and, and thanks for everything that Microsoft does, I think in particular on apprenticeships, which I know well, and I think that's an enormous example uh, for many to look at. I think probably three things, if I may. I think three things I'd ask of you and, and everyone else. The first is to continue investing in R&D, because that's something where we need to do a better job of, right? I, ultimately, it's you. It's free enterprise, it's the private sector that drive growth, and I think we need to do a better job of investing in R&D. The government's going to do it bit, its bit, but that's not sufficient. We need all of you to keep investing in innovation and prioritizing it in the way that we have. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is around regulation. Now, I think the CBI talked about the idea of an office for future regulation, but I, we need your ideas. So when it comes to the industries of the future where you're all working, you're going to be far faster than someone sitting in Whitehall <laughs> to see at where the new barriers are or where the regulations aren't keeping pace with what you're trying to do. And so you need to come to me. You need to come to the Chancellor and the Business Secretary and say, OK, this over here in data, this over here in clinical trials, you know, this over here in AI regulation, this over here in fintech, and uh, whatever it might be. Uh, we can't, you know, we, we, we will try and do it, but ultimately you're going to know it better and faster than we ever will. So please do come to us with those specific ideas about how to create, as I said, the most innovation-friendly, future-focused regulatory regime in the world, because that's what we want to deliver for you. And then the third thing is on talent. I think when I talk to all of you, the number one thing you all talk to me about is talent, is how do we get access to the skilled people we need? And obviously, you know, LinkedIn is a great, a great place to look at that. But what I need from you is the specific areas, the pinch points that are holding our growth back. I think it, it's kind of generic to say, well, we have you know, we have pressure in IT jobs, right? But I need to know more specifically. It's in crowd, cloud computing. It's in data analytics. These are the specific things we need. And here, by the way, is the type of qualification, qualification we need to fix it, right? We can do a one-year conversion course or a three-month skills boot camp, and then we can work in partnership together to invest in people and make sure that we fill the specific skills gaps that are holding you and the country back. Uh, and I think we've started that conversation, but I'd like to carry it on and make sure we deliver on it. I think the Prime Minister's just launched the next CBI consultation. So answers, please, on a postcard to me. We'll give them to the PM. Right, James Roth is the CEO of Wynn Campton. James, come on in. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Prime Minister. Um, so we're the uh, largest UK-owned uh, logistics service provider, uh, and we have quite a lot of warehouses around the country. And in common with a lot of the UK economy, we have a productivity issue. Um, exacerbated by labor shortages and spiraling uh, spiraling uh, labor cost inflation and one of the main solutions to that is to automate more yeah. more robotics working alongside our people um, but when we look for partners um, to, to work with to develop those solutions we mostly have to look overseas particularly when it comes to the hardware um, what I'm interested in is how can we partner better with government to help develop that sector onshore so that there's more of a provision and we can work better in that way? That's an ex excellent question. and goes to the heart of some of the questions before about what's the right balance between investment and productivity and migration. Now, look, I, I think there are some really fantastic examples. Your business is one. 
right now at Lincoln University, the government's funding, I think, R&D, working in partnership with others to create more automation in fruit picking, which has been an area of, of challenge in the past. You know, Astra at the moment are piloting use of robotics in, uh, in their factories. And one of, one of my kind of most interesting visits as chancellor was to a lighting factory in the Northeast where they had taken out a lot of the, the human action when it came, comes to forklift trucks in their warehouse, replaced it all with robotics. And not only was that great for productivity, it was great for quality of output and mistakes and great for safety of workers. So I think it shows the promise of what you can do when you get this right. And when I was talking to them about, well, I, I, this is great. How do we spread this across the country? It, you know, it was interesting. The thing that they focused most on was kind of management experience with that type of technology. And the person I was speaking to had been trained, unsurprisingly, by the Japanese in lean manufacturing techniques up in one of the other plants in the Northeast. But that's why you know, spreading best practice across the UK through innovations that Tony has championed, like Made Smarter, for example, and just making sure that our businesses have the skills they need to adopt that type of technology, I think is a big part of the answer where we need to do more. Also, it's about making sure the regime for investment is, is uh, attractive, and that's why the AIA, as talked about, the annual investment allowance, full expensing for capital investment for 98% of businesses. And of course, over time, it would be nice to be able to do more. Um, that's the other piece of the puzzle that we need to get right. Uh, and then lastly is the regulatory side. And that's where, again, I'm reliant on you to say, we'd love to do this thing. Here's the block. You know, can we flex it or change it? Um, and again, we're open to doing all of those three things. Because I think your point is right. If we can get that right with more robotics and automation, then we can drive up productivity. It reduces some of the pressure on labor, creates good jobs for people, uh, and it's something that we lag behind in. I think there was a study from the Robotics Federation or whoever it was a, a couple of years ago which showed that you know, we under-index for the amount of automation and robotics, even when you control for the sectoral mix of our economy. Um, so that, to me, is actually low-hanging fruit when we talk about how do we drive up growth. We've got an opportunity there to do it, uh, and to do it relatively quickly, I hope. Rishi, you should be a chief executive. You're wasted in this job. <laughs> right, uh, let's, let's let the final question from Emma Swan, who's the CFO of Ball Group. Emma, and you can tell us a bit about your business. You're a local business. Emma Swan, Just I'm the up. finance director at Ball UK. Um, we extrude aluminium. We're based in Leicestershire, and we're classified as an energy-intensive business. So my question is, what more will the government do to support firms on energy costs, and also to give confidence um, to help us make longer-term investments in alternative renewable energy sources. Emma, great that you could be here, and congratulations on what your business is, uh, is doing. And I know it's been tough, as the first thing to say, right? If you're in an energy-intensive business, you know, the last six months, 12 months have been horrendously difficult. And that's why we've put in place, as you know, an enormous amount of support, something like £55 billion, to help both families and businesses between now and the end of the financial year. Uh, hopefully that's made a difference to your business. Uh, good, I can see you nodding, so I, I'm glad to hear that. Look, going forward after that, given the circumstances, it's right, responsible, that we adjust how that support works. It will be more targeted at those businesses that need our help the most, and that's something that the Chancellor is working on as we speak, and we'll publish more plans in, in due course. Uh, but we recognize a particular issue with a group of industries who are very reliant on uh, energy that we need to make sure we have a, a plan for. And I said, you can expect the Chancellor to address that. But your other point was, you know, looking forward, what can we do? Well, I, I think actually, again, it goes back to this point about investment. Can we support you to make the investments to make your business more energy efficient, to take advantage of new technologies? That's why things like the AIA are so important. And again, hopefully your business can benefit that from that with some of the investments you're making. I think we need a regulatory regime that incentivizes the creation of cheaper uh, renewable energy, and we're doing that, whether it's CFDs or whether it's reducing the planning time for offshore wind turbines to, from, I think, four years to almost a year is, is the plan. So those are the types of things we can do to help solve this problem, problem over the long term and, and give you confidence that this will be a country where the energy you need is not only secure, uh, but it is also clean and it's also affordable. And I'm confident that the plans that we've got in place will move us uh, to that world, because that's going to be good for your business, good for the people you employ, and ultimately good for the country. Okay, everybody. Prime Minister, we are so grateful that with everything that's going on in your world, you've not only come up on the train to see us, you've engaged with everybody's questions, 
and you've set out the beginnings of a really exciting agenda around innovation. So on behalf of everybody here, but I'm sure you'll join me in with applause, Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Very good. Very good. We'll see you all. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, and now I'm going to fill some time for you while we reset the stage. Uh, I just wanted to echo Tony's thanks to the Prime Minister for coming here. For